Next, from Springfield, we speak with State Representative Jeannie Ives about her disappointment with Bruce Rauner and why she is considering challenging him for the Republican nomination for governor. This runs about 40 minutes. Jeannie Ives, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Thank you for having me. You and I have talked uh, numerous times over the years about various issues, but mm -hmm. uh, lately you've been in the news a lot more, and it's uh, being speculated that you may be running for governor against uh, Republican Governor Bruce Rauner and challenging him for the Republican nomination. So let me just ask you, where are you in that decision-making process? Well, we're exploring it. I have an entire team behind me that are, is looking at that race uh, to challenge Governor Rauner in the Republican primary. And it probably seems a little bit daunting to most people. Uh, after all, he's a very wealthy businessman, can self-fund his campaign, and, and I don't have those kind of resources behind me right now. But what I do have behind me is I really believe the people of Illinois. And not just your typical grassroots activists that are just fired up about a tax increase or something like that. I think I've heard from a number of people from a different constituencies that are just fed up with, you know, the politicians in Springfield and what's happened to them. They've seen a 32% tax increase, and they now know that that money's going to something that many of them find reprehensible, which is abortion. So we have taxpayer-funded abortion. You, you've, they've seen their money go to bail out Exelon, a $2.2 billion net income company, on the back of ratepayers. And they know that the income tax increase is also going to go to bail out Chicago and their teacher pensions. And uh, meanwhile, they made promises that they can't keep. So there's a serious challenge that needs to be taken to the entire Springfield uh, class of politicians. And unfortunately, Governor Rauner has somewhat become one of those folks. So yes, we are exploring running against uh, Rauner. Uh, in the Republican primary, and I've got a team behind us, me looking at all that what it takes to get that job done so we can make a credible challenge. If you decided to run in that decision-making process, some would say, well, or ask, is she running to make a point, or would she be basing her decision right. does she think she could actually win? Would you run if you thought you couldn't win, but you thought you could bring some issues to the fore? Or would you be running only if you thought there was a path to victory? No, I'm not up for any sort of, uh, you know, mission just to, to, to uh, you, know, you know, raise hell around the state, so to speak. Um, although I, am, I do want to wake people up to the challenges that are facing us. I think there's a, a path to victory here in the state of Illinois. I think um, the political climate is so bad. You've seen an entire outrage from Cook County on their soda tax. People are kind of getting upset about what's happening with their property. Well, they're upset about their property taxes, and they're waking up to what's going on. And you've got an entirely different medium now with all the social media going out there that it's much less complicated to run a campaign and target your voters and, and let them know what's going on. So, so we think there's a credible path. And for sure, I know in the Republican primary, he is going to have a race on his hands trying to defeat somebody like me because he is universally rejected by Republicans around the state. He, will, he can't show up at places downstate. He's doing video announcements of everything. Um, you know, and he has been told, we don't want you to show up at our function. So the, the Republican constituency is completely uh, upset with this man. So there's definitely a path to victory to win it in the primary. I also think that Illinoisans are fed up with what the Democrats have delivered to them. You just got a tax increase again, a bailout of Chicago. You've got the, the speculation of a new gas tax increase. You've had money siphoned off from municipalities. Uh, you've had you know, all sorts of bad things happen. Businesses fleeing the state. It's all on the backs of the Democrats. You haven't had a balanced budget since, two, since 2001. All of the hands of Mike Madigan. So. Um, People are aware of that. And what is the Democrat candidates promising? They're promising you um, more problems for business, so there are more regulations on business. They're already promising that. They're promising a progressive tax. Um, they will not do anything on property taxes because they just gave Barrios a pass in Cook County, even though it's been known for years that his assessments are out of whack and that he's hurting the poor minority communities. So 
Look, voters are waking up. They're on to the Democrats. And I think they will soundly reject another billionaire like a J.B. Pritzker. So he's he cannot relate to the average Illinoisan. It's always hard to judge how much does the average person follow Illinois politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I, you're, you're in the legislature. I'm um, covering it for some 20 years. And so the danger is that you talk to inside baseball, but what's the reality on the street? Right. A lot of people, as you've mentioned, I think are just feeling enormous pain in property taxes. They're being taxed out of their homes, out of their businesses. I would argue, not the editorial wise, but just looking as assessing the situation. The only income tax, even with this increase, isn't, doesn't make the state non-competitive with area, surrounding states. Uh, but the property taxes do. Property yeah. taxes make it that I would say it's very hard to convince someone to bring their to either stay in Illinois or bring a business into Illinois. Do you have any ideas on what you would do about some? What, what, well, let me just ask, rather than ask a narrow question, let me uh, if you were elected governor, what kind of things would you want to do to get the state back to where it should be? Okay, can I, I'm going to take this in two parts. One, sure. I kind of want to address your idea about us being relatively low as it goes for income taxes. That may be true, but when you add up the entire burden on all our excise taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, um, uh, uh, income taxes, when you add that burden up, in many, in some studies, we are, you know, have the highest tax burden per capita. So when you, when you do that analysis um, and you compare it to other states, you, here, we just lost the Toyota plant. They're not coming to the state of Illinois. Foxconn moved just across the border to, in Wisconsin, right? Um, we've lost, um, it's in the last 17 years, Indiana that has less than half of our economic size, less than half, has produced four times as many jobs as the state of Illinois. We can't even compete with other entities around, around us that are not as diverse economically. So this is a disaster. I'm going to give you a little story here, though. Um, I grew up in South Dakota, actually, in a very small farming town called Vermilion, South Dakota. It's the home of the University of South Dakota as well. And in the early 90s, uh, I, you know, I, have, I have five siblings. In the early 90s, four of us moved to Illinois for job opportunities all in different areas. So I have a brother in Chicago, one in Lyle, one in Galesburg. My sister gave me a call two weeks ago, and she does real estate back in our hometown. She said, Jeannie, a couple called me up. They want to look at property, and they're from DuPage County, which is where I, I reside. I'm from Wheaton, which is in DuPage County. And so they drove eight and a half hours out to Vermilion, South Dakota, population 10,000, small farming community. And they looked at seven houses and bought one that same day. And so my sister Sarah asked, well, what brings you here? Do you have a job? Do you have relatives? The couple said, we have never been to Vermilion in our life, but we cannot afford our property taxes and we need an affordable place for our kids to go to college. So what do they get when they make that move? South Dakota has no state income tax. South Dakota, South Dakotans maybe pay one quarter of the property taxes on similar property than we do in Illinois. They have a lower sales tax overall. So when you all add it all up, that's a real savings for that family, and they can't afford to stay in Illinois. What I think everybody else should understand, too, is despite those low taxes, they do have paved roads in South Dakota. They have police. They have fire. They have schools. I mean, I graduated from public school in South Dakota and went on to West Point. So this, we are getting outcompeted every turn. And people aren't going to call their legislature, legislator and say, hey, I'm leaving the state unless you change thing, things. People are just going to leave. And that's what's happening. We've had the highest out migration in the last three years. We're bleeding population and businesses and we can't afford it. So wh what would I do differently? That's a good question. First of all, I'd ask everybody to turn out. You have to completely turn out, uh, turn over the Democrat legislature. You must get rid of Mike Madigan. He is stopping all the good economic policies that people would come will, to fruition. People will say that's very unlikely. That's right. They will say that. <clears throat> and, and in fact, um, I just recently interviewed Kent Redfield, who's a, oh, I a know prof him. Mm -hmm. professor emeritus, and for the people who may not have seen it, but 
he's been covering Illinois politics or studying Illinois politics. And I asked him, where is the Republican Party in Chicago? Why, after 70 years, does that city vote solidly Democratic to where we have no competitive races there? Mm -hmm. And as uh, you know, people may or may not know, it's said that a Republican can't win statewide unless you get about 20% of the vote coming out of Cook County. And we look at Bill, Senator Bill Brady, who ran in 2010 against Governor Quinn. Yeah. Out of 102 counties, he carried 99 counties and lost the election. Could you carry? Are you really looking at that? And you, what would, how would you appeal to those voters, maybe who have been voting Democratic all their life and maybe all their parents' lives? What's, what's the appeal to get some of them to say, vote for me, give me well, a chance? Well, here's the appeal. Even those in Cook County, like I said earlier, are tired of taxes. You had a massive revolt over a soda tax when uh, the, their pockets are getting picked clean through the property taxes at probably a hundredfold of what they would have paid in the soda tax. But the whole idea that you can keep taxing these people and not have an effect on them is false. And uh, fortunately, the Tribune has done a great job highlighting the problems with the property tax assessments. And really, it's a game. It's a game played against South Suburban Cook residents that are many of them case, in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, more of the poor minorities. They can't afford those property taxes. They have confiscatory rates. They're paying 25% effective tax rates in some cases, 40% effective tax rates on particular homes. You can't afford to do that. You're paying for your home. Uh, you know, in, in five years, you're paying for your home again, simply on property taxes in some of these poor minority communities. You know what? Game over. We're going to go in there and tell them the story and tell them what needs to be done and so that we can actually win that vote and win them to our side. Because this has to change for everybody. It has to. And, uh, you know, this, this, this city's bankrupt. It's absolutely bankrupt. So I think part of the way that you win is you win by messaging. The other part, though, that I would do once I'm governor is I think nobody's really been a pit bull on taking on public corruption, which is rampant throughout the state. Not even Governor Rauner has really made that a signature issue. He's kind of left it on the back burner. I don't know why, but it's something that resonates with you if you're Republican or Democrat. Public corruption is a big problem in Illinois, and we need to tackle it. So... The executive should do what the executive can. And if given a legislature again in the control of Mike Madigan, look, he's got specific responsibilities by the Constitution. Adopt a revenue number, send a balanced budget. If those aren't done, it's up to the executive to pretty much line item veto things, take the hard cuts, do what they can. You can to balance that budget. But it's also up to the governor to message really well and tell folks what's going on and be truthful. So, so many questions. One, yes, uh, sure. as far as when would you, do you have a deadline by which you would make a decision? I guess there's going to be an, a, sure. a certain, I'm not sure what the deadline is. At a certain point, you've got to have signatures Absolutely. on the, to get yourself on the ballot. Mm -hmm. But from what I'm hearing, now, I, is it accurate to describe you as both a fiscal conservative and a social conservative? Is that how you describe yourself? Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely accurate. I consider myself both a fiscal and social conservative. Um, when I served on Wheaton City Council, though, it became very apparent, though, that to protect taxpayers, all the rules were made in Springfield. And so I really, I came to Springfield for the fiscal issues, really. I came there to be the taxpayer's advocate against all the lobbyists and insiders that are down here trying to pick their pocket. So uh, I didn't come down here for social issues, but I'm happy to be a social conservative. Um, and, but I'm focused on the fiscal issues. That's why I sit on the pension committee. That's why I sit on the labor and commerce committee. Um, that's why I sit on government transparency. Uh, I pick the committees be the, because I think that's where um, the taxpayers need to be protected the most. And we, I want to go back just to mm -hmm. this decision of running for governor. Um, part of it is, can you raise enough money? In your own mind, mm -hmm. can you win? I think you've already made the point. I'll just emphasize it. I, um, Governor Rauner obviously has an unlimited number of funds, seemingly, that he could spend on his own campaign. Yeah, sure. But it might be the same point I think you're making that we saw when Donald Trump ran against Hillary Clinton, uh, that she outspent him by a large amount. But once people already make up their mind about someone, 
running more campaign commercials doesn't really bear much fruit. Um, how much money, first of all, do you think you would have to have to run a campaign? Have you gotten sure. to that number? And and how is it w without giving, I mean, certain things you may not want to <laughs> yeah, talk about just yet, but to the extent that you can, are you reaching out to potential donors? Just is that part of the process to say, oh, hey, yes. can we raise enough mm -hmm. money? Yeah, you know, um, fundraising is a huge part of running a successful campaign, unfortunately. But money provides you the vehicle to get your message out and connect with voters. That's just the truth of it. So, of course, you do have to have donors. Um, I, I tell you what, in the past with my other campaigns, I've had just a number of small donors who have contributed to my campaigns. Um, but now this is a step up. I'm not going to divulge the amount of money, but I'll tell you what, I honestly think Rauner could spend almost all of his fortune and not redeem his reputation. So he's got a challenge on his, on his uh, plate. And how did it come about? <clears throat> Were you approached or did you think to yeah, yourself, I ought to challenge him and then you reached out? So question one, how did that work? And secondly, what was the straw that broke the camel's back in your estimation? I would, I'm going to guess that you supported Governor Rauner when he first was elected. He seemed to be a conservative. He was a Republican, as you mm -hmm. are. What was the process along the way? Where, where did he start going off the track as far as you're concerned? Sure. I supported Governor Rauner in his, uh, his election in 2014 in the general. Um, and, you know, I was happy to stand by a lot of his uh, turnaround points because they were necessary. Um, but he started coming off the rails when he forgot to keep messaging to people and, and demanding the reform that needed to happen. So that was, that's part of it. He never really took the message to the people. You've got to convince the people of where this state is headed in the depths of our problem. We are bankrupt beyond all get out. We are an outlier in terms of our economics. We're not just middle of the pack on any measure of economics. We are way out. And that's affecting our flexibility to do everything to take care of the disability community, to, uh, to actually provide for education so that we can take off some of that burden with property taxes. We have zero flexibility anymore, and he never sold that program. But honestly, he's done some stuff that just makes no sense when it comes to protecting taxpayers. And I've mentioned a few of those, like the Exelon bailout bill. Terrible idea. Um, like um, the, the education bill that passed. One week it was great, the other week it wasn't. So, I mean, we, I came to this decision. I did not like the way that he was pr approaching things to begin with, but really... Uh, I guess when he signed it, a brand new entitlement program that no other governor in the entire United States had signed into to law. When he signed that legislation that allowed for taxpayer funding of abortion, when the state is bankrupt, we are bankrupt. There's no way that you should start, I don't care what the entitlement program is, uh, a new program like this when we're bankrupt. That was the last straw for many people in my party. Um, and I, they basically started drafting me. They started drafting me. Somebody started a Facebook page. Somebody even put up petitions, not knowing you had to have a lieutenant governor on that li list, too. I got started invited, being invited to things statewide. Um, people wanted to draft me to, to run against him because they want a challenger to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry to cut, interrupt. No, I was going to okay. say, how, how did you first react when you heard that? Were you like, are you serious or... How did, how did it strike you? Uh, it, I feel like uh, people who know me and have watched my work probably understand that I am really trying to do the right thing for taxpayers. And I think that they knew that I actually have a backbone and that I will stand in the gap and, and, and make the argument that needs to be made and that I won't be swayed. So I think that they were looking for somebody who was principled, is my point. Um, so I think that's why they actually... We're looking at me. There were other people that were looking at it, too. It's a big challenge, though. Um, so this is a team effort. I got a call from a couple key people that, like, look, Rauner is dead man walking. He's not going to win in 2018. We need another alternative. Republicans should take him out of office instead of Democrats. Jeannie, you should run. So I got a number of those types of calls from people that I respect. So it just started forming that way, and we said, well, why don't we just explore this and see what we can do? Um, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. We're trying to gather the resources to make sure, and that includes um, the right team to put it in place. 
and um, we're still at that stage. We're not too worried about getting petitions done, but we know it does have to happen. It takes what, 25,000? No, it's like 10,000. Is that right? Yeah, I think 5,000 is the minimum. Oh, that's right. right. Yeah. <clears throat> I was thinking of an yeah. independent candidate. No, yeah, I'm not an independent candidate. So, um, and, and before we go into some other issues, mm -hmm. uh, people who may not have heard of you, you're from the Wheaton area, you're representative from that area, suburb, western yes. suburbs of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Just give us a bit of a thumbnail biography of who is Ginny Ives. Well, I'm a mother of five. I guess that's how I define myself more than above everything because uh, the, the fruit of my labor for really the last 26 years have been my children. So I'm the mother of five children, but I did uh, uh, graduate from West Point with a Bachelor of Science in Economics, served in the Army for six years, including uh, uh, platoon leader and commander over in Germany as a, for a transportation unit. And then I did ROTC at Wheaton College as an instructor there for my last assignment. I got out to raise my family. And I've done some tax and bookkeeping work along the way part-time. Ran for Wheaton City Council. And then actually got um, asked to run for the state rep seat by somebody I respect who knew where the game was played far better than I did. And I understood that once I got here. So that's kind of my background. Um, my oldest son is serving in the Army. He's a U.S. Army officer, uh, infantry officer up in Fort Wainwright, Alaska. He's a uh, ranger tabbed. And um, my second son graduated also from West Point, and he's cross-commissioned to the Navy. And he's down in Corpus Christi. He's going to be a Navy pilot. I've got a third son at Ole Miss studying accounting. And I've got a junior at Wheaton Warrenville South, our public school in Wheaton. And then I've got a eighth grade daughter at St. Michael in, school in Wheaton. So. Uh, that's kind of my family. My you know, husband does large utility construction projects around the Midwest. Um, he's the director of project management for a big company that does that. So it sounds like on one hand, you, your family uh, in many ways probably profiles many other families. I, I think mean, we're the typical Illinois family, quite frankly. I really do. You know, we're... You know how yeah, so, middle so, class families yeah. might look. It, right. it looks wealthy from the right. outside, but you don't know how families are struggling right. just to maintain that lifestyle month by month. Yeah, you know, look, Christmas rolls around, rolls off, and in January you're trying to find, you know, 100 bucks each for three kids to go into Park District Baseball that is, um, you know, uh, parent-run coaching. And you're wondering, why am I spending $100 on baseball when the parents are the coaches? And you, can't, you just can't figure out what government's doing with the money all the time, right? Um, so, you know, you're, you're putting your kids in school, and we did pay for private school because we wanted that choice. But even public school, there's lots of fees that go along with that. Property taxes are enormous. They keep climbing. And, um, y you know, we're very typical that way. You know, <clears throat> as you assess us, a lot of, well, Illinois is predominantly uh, a Democratic state. That's why the legislature right now is run by the Democrats. Um, for 12 years before Bruce Rauner, the Democrats ran everything. Mm -hmm. If you were the nominee, people are obviously going to attack you and probably on social issues. Sure. Well, they'll probably That's attack right. you on everything. Yeah. But uh, what would you say to those mothers and fathers out there that go, you know, on one hand, she sounds like us, but maybe they're pro choice and say, I don't know if I can support somebody who's pro life. Well, do you really want your tax money going to pay for abortion? I mean, that's the extent of the argument right now in the state of Illinois when it comes to being pro-choice because uh, the federal government has already weighed in on abortion. It's whether or not taxpayers should pay for it. And actually, when this was polled, uh, well over the majority of taxpayers, and the, the poll was weighted towards Democrats, said no. We don't want taxpayer money paid for that. So the thing that should resonate with most people is that if we don't get back on track, it won't matter if you're pro-choice or pro-abortion, this state is going down and your taxes are going to go up to pay for it. And the city of Chicago is bankrupt, even as they take on more debt and more debt. And they're going to ask for more money from you in the suburbs uh, and they're going to extract it through the income tax and then they're going to send it to Chicago that doesn't educate its kids. That's what's going to happen. And I think that's the argument that needs to be made to people. That, um, you know what, uh, 
you, aren't you concerned about uh, if you want to be uh, pro-choice, uh, how about the choice between choosing um, staying in the state of Illinois for your kids or having to go somewhere else? That's choice. That's the choices people are making. How about uh, there have been votes? Um, I, <laughs> I think it might have been the temporary budget bill uh, of a year ago. Oh, yes. And I think you were one of four people that voted no. That's correct. Um, which, on one hand, speaks to your backbone, that you, know, you are not a, afraid to buck the trend if you believe in something. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, people would say, you know, we've just had Bruce Rauner, who right. had to be his way or the highway. Uh, we're concerned about having somebody who can't work with others. Okay. What would you say to that? I mean, are you, would you be <laughs> too stubborn that you couldn't um, bend a bit to, right. to work with people to get something passed, particularly if it remains, as I would say as a political observer probably would at this point, remains a democratically controlled legislature? Very good question. I'm sure that is something that people want to understand. So, uh, you know, Governor Rauner basically hit Mike Madigan every single day. That was his nemesis. And there's no doubt that Mike Madigan has controlled the legislature with an iron fist. Nothing gets through his legislature without his approval. Um, that's why you hire a governor to be the backstop to the bad legislation. So you have to recognize that, look, Mr. Madigan, go ahead, do, your, do what you want, fire, fire their, uh, you know, file those bills, pass them through. I'm going to stop the bad legislation that goes through. When it comes to a budget, hand me your budget, you know, and let's see where that goes. They have to produce a budget. That's what they have to do. The, and the, then the governor decides what to do with it at that point. The so, knock, one of the knocks on, on Bruce Rauner is that he champions verbally a balanced budget, but that he never proposed one. Well, that's true. That is true. So uh, we would propose, obviously, a balanced budget. Um, you know, it, we have enormous debt, too. You know, we have $250 billion in debt. Every single taxpayer in the state of Illinois is on the hook right now for over $50,000 per taxpayer in debt. $50,000. People aren't going to stay here to pay that debt. They're going to leave the state of Illinois. So I'm not sure many of your listeners have heard about that. But as far as it goes with working with Democrats, I was the lead legislature, legislator on getting a reform through uh, for the College of DuPage, DuPage debacle. I was the lead legislator. I'll tell you what, Republicans rebuked that bill, stood up against my bill, and I'm a Republican. I had to get the Democrats to help me get that reform through. So I've worked with them in a number of ways. Just today, and I'm appalled by this action, but just today, my property tax task force language that I filed back in February was hijacked, hijacked by the Democrats. They stole my task force language and passed it off as their own copied it. If I could have copyrighted my bill, I'd be suing them right now. Look, I went to West Point. You don't lie, cheat, or steal. Lie, steal, or cheat. Nor tolerate those that do. They stole my work product today. That's what they did. So the Democrats even know when I have good legislation. They do. They just want to take the credit for it. And that's what they did today. So... <clears throat> You had mentioned you worked also on pensions as an yes. issue. Mm -hmm. um, I'll share with people, I did my master's thesis back in 1993 on the coming collapse of publicly funded pensions. <laughs> when we look at virtually any pension system across yes. the United States and at the federal government level, they're underfunded because they always overpromise benefits and underfund them. And people say, well, if we had made the payments all along, no, you still would have had a problem because you're promising Rolls Royce benefits on uh, Volkswagen contributions. That's right. But that said, how do we balance a budget when the pensions continue to increase in the state of Illinois and we have a constitutional provision that says those cannot be diminished? The people back in 1970 that passed the Constitution bound the hands of future legislatures, which is always a bad idea. Mm -hmm by writing in that provision that doesn't allow us to adjust our spending on a key provision. I think in about 2002, 
pensions were only 5% of the general revenue fund, and now mm -hmm. they're about 25%. So they continue to crowd out the money that we tend to think sure. would go for operating the state. Now we also have a constitutional amendment that says you can no longer rob the transportation funds to pay for education and other things. Sure. So how would these restrictions, have you thought about, is it possible to balance the budget unless you first get a constitutional amendment that undoes the diminishment clause that protects pensions? We do need that constitutional amendment. We do need a provision where we can, we can uh, in the future, diminish those. Everybody believes, though, that even if that amendment were in place, it would be prospectively. So um, you have to take this in steps. First of all, you need to immediately put an act in the legislation, a Tier 3. They just did a Tier 3, so now we need Tier 4 that really seriously says... We are not, we are ending public pensions in the state of Illinois. Everybody and will have, have a, like a 401k, 401k style. Right. Everybody, new hires should, should have a 401k style. We already have this program with the state university retirement systems. People self-select this self-managed plan. It's been very successful. It can produce uh, the similar level of benefits that uh, pensions do as well because you cannot take anything out of it. It's a great concept, and it's what we already a tool. We have to stop the bleeding first. That is the first step. After that, you can look to other ways that you can offer buyouts for people uh, for these pensions and buy them out. You can look to then finally amortize it. Until you've frozen them off, though, anytime you re-amortize this debt and you just push it off into the future, you're just pushing all that debt on to our kids who are going to wake up one day and wonder what happen and they're you know they're not going to stay in illinois they're going to leave illinois as well so um the pension is a huge issue just a couple things though to consider last year the municipal labor fund of chicago paid out nearly a billion dollars like 999 million dollars i'm sorry what paid out this was the late municipal and laborers fund in chicago okay. they only took in 99 million dollars and they paid out a billion. They paid out a billion. You can't do that. Teacher retirement system is our largest system. It's 38% funded. Even the TRS director said, essentially, once you are at 30% funded, you almost cannot recover. And pensioners are foolish to think that taxpayers are going to continue to fund these in the future. There will be a day of reckoning when the money is run out and we cannot afford it and the courts are going to take over. And so that, that is what's going to happen. That's why I don't understand why these pension people that are on public pensions don't understand that the whole house of cards is going to come down. And they may not get what they, pay, what they uh, think they deserve. They may have to take a haircut just like you saw in Detroit. But I'll tell you what, on the opposite side what's going on, since there is... Um, there's, there's, you know, other municipalities that have problems right now and are bankrupt. Um, the opposite side of this is that in the case of a default, the bondholders get held harmless and only the pensioners and only st uh, services suffer. That's the wrong prescription. Yet that's what the Democrats already have put in place through special legislation they hid in the budget bill. They already put in place that type of legislation. In the, so, in the budget just passed? In the passed. budget bill that just passed. Yes, Michael Madigan snuck in a provision that essentially says bondholders in the case of default who have securitized streams of income from the, from the state will be held harmless in the case of that default. And Chicago's already rebonded about $3 billion of debt to accommodate that. That's not good. Not you know, to argue a, so, a point, but I would say... This gets in the weeds really quickly. People should understand. It's hard to imagine that the city of Chicago would go bankrupt, that the Chicago public schools would go bankrupt, and that while the state of Illinois can't legally go bankrupt, that it can suffer the pains of bankruptcy for all practical purposes. Places like Harrisburg, Pennsylvania went bankrupt. Uh, Vallejo, California, Orange County, California. There are places and governments where they have gone bankrupt. Detroit, which was once a very a powerhouse, economic mm -hmm. powerhouse, brought to its knees. 
And Detroit might have been for some other reasons. I'm not sure of that. But these other places were into bankruptcy because of pensions. And when that happens, the recipients of those pension benefits do not get them. It doesn't really matter that there's a protection that says they can't be diminished. When you take the last dollar out of the pantry, so to speak, there's just no more. So that's the reality. There is an economic reality. And I think sometimes when we talk about the legalese of the diminishment clause of the Constitution, that doesn't put money in the right. system to pay the benefits. Right. So, no, I mean, this is, a, this is kind of a very difficult subject for people to understand. I, I, first thing you need to know is that we do not have bankruptcy law in the state of Illinois. So there's no municipality that can technically go bankrupt because we don't allow it by, by law. It only means that you can hike and hike and hike property taxes, which is already happening in the city of Harvey that was directed by a court to increase their property tax levy to pay for pensions in the firefighter fund. So the courts have stepped in and said, look, you better hike property taxes to pay for this person's pension. Now, these people, you know, they're retiring at age 50. Uh, in many cases, they have multi-million dollar pensions. Um, in, in the case of teachers, they get everything back in about two years on average. Uh, so they're getting 3% compound coals. I don't know if that's the case for the firefighters in Harvey, but this is largely the case around the state. These pensions are very generous compared to the private sector, and the private sector is having to pay for them. So this is a big, deep issue that we have to confront. So they, you can stick your head in the, in the sand, but the truth is that these contracts have to be negotiated. We are past that point. It's just that nobody's talking about it. And nobody wants, I don't want bankruptcy in the state of Illinois, too. I don't want bankruptcy in Chicago. And when I say that they're bankrupt, I mean that technically they just keep on adding to the credit card and they can't pay their bills with the income coming in, okay? For anybody else in the, in the state, that's pretty much bankrupt. If you're in your personal household, that's pretty much you're headed to bankruptcy. They have eight times more debt than they have income coming into the city of Chicago. What, what is that, right? It's unsustainable. That's what that is. So this is a really difficult subject to talk about. But rational beings have to sit down and renegotiate many of these contracts. And you know what? Average Illinoisans are being gamed by the system. Right now there's a strike going on, and I apologize if I can't, if I cannot remember what district uh, it is, but I was reading the details of it, and they're essentially arguing over uh, health care costs. And, and then in the, the, the bottom of the uh, paragraph, they also do note that the, the, the entire cost of pensions is picked up by the taxpayers. So the teachers who are supposed to pay 9.4% pay nothing towards their own pension. The taxpayers pick up the whole amount. In two-thirds of the school districts around the state of Illinois, taxpayers pay all or a portion of the entire pension amount. These people aren't kicking in anything. They're not kicking in a 3% match to a 401k. They're not even kicking in a 6.2% Social Security max. Taxpayers are paying for it all. Who thinks that's fair? It's categorically not fair. We are being taken advantage of by unions who have set this system up and perpetuate the, the, that by threatening to strike. So time to get control of this because it's just going to be like that couple who left DuPage County for South Dakota. Jeannie, I know it's been a long day for you, and yeah. I could talk forever. I know. Uh, you're an interesting Thank you. person, but we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. And uh, as always, we can hopefully follow up on some other issues. Good luck in your decision-making process, and we'll look forward to talking with you again. Great. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.